My name is Mark Polk and this is my RV garage. I got bit by the RV bug when I was 15 years old and still have it today. I started in this industry washing campers and since that time I've helped educate over a quarter million RVers on how to safely and properly use and maintain their RV. My favorite pastimes are RVs, muscle cars, and motorcycles. Welcome to my RV garage. This episode of Mark's RV Garage is sponsored in part by Camping World and KOA, Campgrounds of America. Tyler, wake up. We're going to go work on the trailer. It's Saturday morning. Come on, we're burning daylight. Ugh. Come on now. We have the interior of the Yellowstone pretty much gutted now. Uh, most of the damage I saw was around the windows and the framing uh, where water got to it, which is an easy fix. Uh, I did notice some pretty serious water damage in the bottom rear corner on the door side of the trailer. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to make the repairs from the inside. If I can't, we're going to have to take the metal off and uh, make the repairs from the exterior. Well, at precisely 1.25 in the afternoon on day two of the demo stage, I've made the decision to go ahead and take the metal off the outside, so it's official now. We're going to start with taking the molding around the edges off, and then we're going to see how difficult it's going to be to get the metal off. I also made the decision to go ahead and take the metal roof off, put some decking on the roof, and then probably try to put a rubber roof on this old Yellowstone. <laughs> There's a good possibility that I'll try to save this edge molding that goes around the trailer where the sides and the front and the, and the sides and the rear meet. Uh, so I'm going to try to take it off carefully and not bend it. If I can't find some new uh, edge molding to use, then this is all we've got. sure how well you can see this, but where, where they lap the metal from the, the front and the back over on the side, uh, of course they had the molding and the molding was screwed in all along the edge. But then you can see right here they put little tacks, little nails every so often. Uh, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to carefully use a pry bar and get these nails out and then uh, the metal should come off pretty easy. As we were tearing the inside of the trailer apart, uh, I brought one of the drawers out and I found this envelope and I, when I opened it I actually found the original owner's manual. It actually has all the guides to the appliances, it's got the, the warranty cards, all that information that you would get with a new trailer and I'm really happy to find the actual Yellowstone owner's manual for the 67 trailer. Pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. Putting all 
the exterior metal back here so it'll be safe and it won't get bent or anything. Believe it or not, this is the truck that's going to be pulling the trailer one day. My next project, a 1948 Willis pickup truck with a four-cylinder engine. Well, you can see we're into this thing pretty deep now. Um, I, I made the decision to take the metal off the outside because I did notice some pretty severe water damage, especially down here in this uh, rear corner. And you can see right here where at one point in time somebody patched the floor, so we're going to have to address that issue. Uh, I, did, I left some of the metal on the trailer to kind of keep it uh, a little more rigid and some strength, and we'll, we'll start working on the framing, and we'll just go from there. If you look closely, you'll see a, a bolt that goes down through the uh, wood framing and through a cross member on the metal frame. Back to the trailer frame repairs right after this short lunch break. I found this roll of metal strapping at the home improvement store. You can see here where they used metal strap to reinforce the wood structure when it was first built. I plan to use metal straps at most of the joints in the wood framing. It's also good to put this metal strapping over areas where we run our wiring so we don't accidentally run a screw or nail into the wire when we put our wall coverings back on. Getting ready to reframe the back wall and we've got a couple of concerns we need to address before we do it. Uh, number one is the bunk bed that goes in the back here needs to be secured from the back of the trailer so we need to make sure we've got a brace for that. And number two, we're using a new window, we're upgrading the window that was in the back so we've got to completely reframe the back wall to accommodate that window. So it's just going to take some calculations, some measurements, and everything should work out fine. I don't know if you ever used this before, but it's called Gorilla Glue. This is some great stuff and I plan to use it wherever I want some added strength in the wood. If you want wood to hold together, your best bet is to glue and screw it for longevity. It's looking pretty good. Uh, what we're going to have to do at this point, our metal overlap comes in right here, so we're going to have to put a cross brace here, a cross brace over here, probably two more cross members on the bottom, and then since we're using a radius window, I'll uh, probably have to build some rounded corners in here so when we clamp this window in place, it's got some good wood to grab a hold of. But it's looking real good right now. We're 
We're getting ready to frame our sidewall, and what we're trying to do is eliminate these two jealousy windows right here by putting in one larger window. We're running into a couple complications with the height because of where our kitchen countertop was, so we're going to have to really do some measuring and see if this bigger window is going to fit. And all I can say is I hope it does because it would look really nice. But what we did was we hung the metal up so we get an idea of where the old windows were. Anybody out there want to buy a trailer, just email mark at rveducation101.com. <laughs> I've got a good deal for you. Tune in next time when Mark and Tyler finish framing the trailer walls and start making repairs to the trailer roof. If you travel with kids, grandkids, or pets, you won't want to leave home without the product we're going to talk about today. And the good news is it's inexpensive and easy to install. The product I'm talking about is a Ruggeds RV Step Rug. Let's put this baby on the RV right now. The Ruggeds RV Step Rug fits most manual and electric steps. It's made of high quality olefin with a solid rubber backing. This RV step rug is designed to last in all weather conditions and the great news is the deep treads trap the dirt at the door, not inside the RV. To install the step rug, simply place it on the step with the grommets on the underside. Feed one of the zip ties through any of the front grommets and follow it through the corresponding rear grommet. Secure the zip tie by feeding the tip through the locking end of the zip tie. Repeat this on the remaining grommets. Trim the excess from the zip ties and you're ready to start catching the dirt at the door. It's a super easy installation and it works great. You can use one Ruggeds RV step cover or you can install one on each of the steps. Ruggeds RV step covers are available at www.campingworld.com. What's my favorite type of RV? Boy, that's a tough one. I like just about every type of RV for one reason or another, but I've gotten spoiled over the years, so I would probably have to say motorized RVs. I guess I like the convenience they have to offer while you're traveling. But I wouldn't count the old Yellowstone out. It'll be fun to camp in this, too. Lots of RVers get started in the RV lifestyle because they don't want to leave their pets when they travel. Traveling by RV affords the owner the opportunity to travel with their best friends. RV owners are some of the biggest pet lovers I have ever met. Our dogs, Buck and Gracie, have traveled with us in our RV since they were puppies. They are both great travelers and companions. Another dog entered our life last year. This is Roxy's story. One day last summer, my son came to us and said it looked like a dead animal was lying under our Jeep outside. When we took a closer look, we discovered it was a dog, or at least what resembled a dog. She could barely stand up and walk, but was anxious and grateful to get some dog food. The dog lost most of her hair and was covered with mange and mites and engorged ticks were feeding on her. I was quite certain on the day we found her that she would need to be humanely euthanized. The next morning, Dawn took her to our favorite vet, Dr. Jack Hill. After a thorough examination, he told us there was a slim possibility he might be able to help her. He said he was willing to try if we were willing to take her in if she made it through this ordeal. At that point, there was hope. She was officially named Roxy, and we welcomed her into our hearts and into our family. 
Our vet kept Roxy for several weeks while she endured a rigorous treatment schedule of medication, daily bathing, exercise, and the long road to recovery. The weeks passed until we were finally able to bring Roxy home. We enjoyed getting to know her as we kept up with the medicated bass, daily medication, and routine commutes to the vet for shots. A week or so passed and Roxy began to relapse, bleeding from sores that broke out all over her skin. Roxy went back to the vet and we were scheduled to leave a few days later on a planned five week long summer RV trip. We checked on Roxy's progress daily. Several weeks into the trip and several thousand miles away from home, her prognosis took a turn for the worse. Dr. Hill told us to be prepared in the event she would need to be euthanized. The trip was fun, but Roxy weighed heavy on all of our minds. Roxy continued to fight and slowly rebounded. We think Roxy was born to the wild and fended for herself outdoors for most of her life. She has a very poor immune system, skin problems, and issues with her ears and larynx. During her long stay with the vet, the workers made progress with housebreaking and crate training Roxy. She came home when we returned from the trip and continues to show signs of improvement each day. She will probably need to be on medication for the rest of her life. We treat her ears, give her oral medication, and a shot every two to three days to prevent her from relapsing and losing all of her hair again. Welcome home, Roxy. Roxy is a sweet-natured dog, and she took to living in a comfortable house very quickly. It took Buck and Gracie a while to accept her into what Mark now calls our pack of dogs. She demands our attention and is extremely loyal. Mark said this one's not allowed on the furniture, but he already lost that battle. She does sleep in her crate, though. Two dogs on the bed are enough. At RV Education 101, we offer walkthrough DVDs on the type of RV you own that teach everything you need to know about your RV. If you are already familiar with how your RV works, we offer a DVD six pack with six specialized DVD titles like Deep Cycle Batteries, RV Care and Maintenance, RV Awnings, RV Safety Features, and more. For more information on these DVD products, visit www.rveducation101.com. How did RVing get started in America? I think it got its start when the American automobile industry embraced assembly line production. By the end of 1913, the time it took to assemble a Model T chassis was cut from 12 and a half hours to 2.7 hours. By 1916, the price of a Model T dropped to $360, making it affordable to the average working middle class family. Auto camping quickly spread across America. People could travel with cooking and camping equipment in their vehicles and avoid riding on trains and staying in overcrowded hotels. This was the great appeal of auto camping, which led to the craze that we know of as RVing today. It's time for another question and answer. Paul writes, is it okay to leave my RV plugged in when we are not using it? This could be for several months at a time. And, should I start the engine every week or so? Good questions, Paul. Leaving the unit plugged in depends on what type of battery charger your RV converter has. If it's a three-stage charger with a maintenance or float stage, it's okay to leave it plugged in. The three-stage charger is designed to prevent the batteries from being overcharged, but I still recommend you check the water levels periodically if you do leave the unit plugged in. Check your owner's manual for information on the converter. If it's not a three-stage charger, you can leave it unplugged and start it periodically or use a product like the battery miner to keep the batteries charged while it's in storage. As for your second question, I always add a fuel preservative to the fuel tank when our unit will sit idle for more than a couple months at a time. 
I run the engine and generator long enough for the preservative to get through the fuel system, but I still think it's good to start and run the engine and generator at least monthly when it's in storage. This will allow the oil to lubricate all the dry components of the engine. When you run the generator, be sure and run it with at least a half-rated load on it and try to run it for at least an hour at a time. You should be able to find the load ratings in the generator owner's manual. Previous episodes of Mark's RV Garage can be viewed at www.rvconsumer.com and on YouTube. All episodes are archived at www.rvvideosondemand.com for easy retrieval and viewing. Having mirrors on our tow vehicle or motorhome and knowing how to properly adjust and use our mirrors are two different things. Today we're going to give you a quick refresher on how to maximize your RV mirrors. Let's head to the parking lot and get started. For the most part, there are two types of mirrors commonly found on motorhomes. There are the type that extend out in front of the motorhome on long arms and the type that are fixed to the sides of the motorhome. If you have the type of mirrors that extend out in front of your motorhome on long arms, you need to make sure the inside edge of the mirror is flush with the side of the coach. The best way to check your mirrors is to stand in front of your coach and sight down the side. The inside of the mirror head should look like it is just touching the side of the coach. Having the mirror flush with the side of the coach gives you the best overall view. On the passenger side of the coach, you should set the mirror flush with the outside edge of the awning arms. If the mirror is too far in or too far out, you are losing valuable viewing area. Adjust the flat part of the mirror so you can just see the side of your coach along the inside edge and so you are looking back level with the ground about one-fourth of the way from the top of the mirror. You really don't need to see a lot of sky. If the convex or spot mirrors are independently adjustable, set them the best you can so you can see out horizontally to the ground and alongside the coach. Most people do not use their convex mirrors for general driving because it's not easy to see any detail. You may not see the detail, but the fact that you are seeing a much larger area gives you an advantage. Think of your convex mirrors as an early warning device. They give you warning of a developing situation around you in order for you to take needed action. When set properly, the convex mirrors should be used as much as the flat mirrors for general driving. For more great information on topics like this, check out our Drive Your Motorhome Like a Pro DVD or Tow Your Fifth Wheel Like a Pro DVD, available at www.rveducation101.com. Whether you're heading to Vegas for work or play, don't forget the RV. The Las Vegas KOA at Circus Circus is a great place to camp. This KOA is located within walking distance from the world-famous Las Vegas Strip. The campground can accommodate everyone from tent campers to the biggest motor coach. Let's head to Vegas and see what this KOA campground has to offer. The Las Vegas KOA at Circus Circus is on Las Vegas Boulevard or what's known as the Strip. KOA campers are close to everything Vegas has to offer. If you feel like venturing off the Las Vegas Strip, there are some great places to visit like the Grand Canyon or Red Rock Canyon, Hoover Dam, and Valley of Fire State Park. Don't have an RV? No problem. Stay in one of the Las Vegas KOA Airstream travel trailers. The Las Vegas KOA has 350 plus big rig friendly sites with full hookups. The super sites feature 60 to 80 foot pull throughs with grass, patios, and outdoor furniture. Need a break from all the action? Stop in the great room and watch the big screen TV or catch up with friends on one of the KOA internet kiosks. Make time to enjoy a dip in the pool or ease those tired muscles into a hot tub or sauna. 
traveling with your dog? The Las Vegas KOA offers two off-leash dog parks and a self-service doggy wash. Don't forget about the Wi-Fi service too. On top of all this, you have access to one of Las Vegas' top family resorts. Circus Circus features an indoor theme park known as Adventure Dome, a midway with daily circus acts, swimming pool, spa, award-winning restaurants, and much more. So whether you're coming to Vegas to beat the odds or enjoy some of the most spectacular hiking, mountain biking, and other outdoor activities the area has to offer, the Las Vegas KOA is the only place to stay. We've been to Las Vegas twice on business. The next time we go, it'll be for fun, and I plan to stay in the Las Vegas KOA in our RV. Why not make this KOA campground a destination spot for your 2011 camping season? Having an RV is great, but planning a fun, exciting trip to take in your RV makes only one even better. That's where Microsoft Streets and Trips comes in. Streets and Trips has been the number one best-selling travel and map software for 11 years straight, and there's good reason for it. This travel planning software helps you easily plan your camping and RV travel. There are several features I really like about Streets and Trips when it comes to planning our RV trips. You can tailor your trips by start and stop times or by the speed you are comfortable driving at. Another feature I really like is you can select the types of roads you want to travel on, avoiding interstates and other highways and making your route more scenic. You can include multiple destinations and plan all of your stops to rest and refuel. And you can change your trip plan at any time without internet access. Microsoft Streets and Trips has over 1.9 million points of interest, including campgrounds, state and national parks, gas stations, landmarks, casinos, and much more. Let's take a closer look at Microsoft Streets and Trips. The Microsoft Streets and Trips version with GPS locator gives you all the travel planning features of Streets and Trips software, plus it comes with a compact GPS receiver with advanced GPS features built right in. You simply plug it into your laptop and go. You get real-time location tracking, spoken directions including street names, and automatic rerouting if you miss a turn. The full screen display makes it easier to read maps and directions on your laptop. It even has an easy to read night map display for driving at night. You can quickly locate landmarks near your current location like restaurants, gas stations and hospitals. You can also send location information to your mobile device like a phone and share maps and itineraries with friends, family or your personal navigation device. Our friends at Microsoft Streets and Trips were gracious enough to send us five copies of the Streets and Trips with GPS locator. This is a $70 value and we are giving these away for free, but there's a twist. Send me your best RV camping tip and if I use it on a show episode, you get a copy of Microsoft Streets and Trips absolutely free. I'll even pay the shipping. You can't beat that. So here's what you do. Send me your best RV camping or RV tech tip. For example, to remember that your RV antenna is in the raised position, hang your tow vehicle or motorhome keys from the antenna handle. That way you can't drive off with your antenna up. Boy, I should give myself a copy for a great tip like that. So what are you waiting for? Send me your tips today and start planning your RV trip with Microsoft Streets and Trips tomorrow. I recently had the privilege to correspond with Marty and Patty Shankman. Patty was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2006. After the diagnosis, Marty used his professional background as a tax attorney to establish a charity called RV for the Cause. RV for the Cause is designed to help those living with chronic illness, their caregivers and loved ones by educating professional advisors and consumers about estate, insurance, tax and financial planning for those living with chronic illnesses. Marty and Patty travel the country in their Airstream travel trailer conducting free educational seminars and webinars. We're looking forward to meeting the Shankmans later this month and bringing you their story, but for now I would like to tell you about a series of five free consumer webinars Marty will be conducting from five different Good Sam RV parks on their upcoming trip. 
The goal of these five webinars is to help consumers in general, especially those living with chronic illnesses or disability, understand what they can do to protect themselves and their families. 500 listeners can be hosted for each webinar, so it's important that you register for any of these upcoming webinars you are interested in now. The webinars cover topics like estate planning, living wills, powers of attorney, and revocable living trusts. I am including the dates, topics, and registration information at links posted directly below the video player. For more information on RV for the Cause, please take a minute to visit the website at www.rvforthecause.org. Be sure to register now for the webinars and put the dates on your calendar. The webinars are absolutely free, but you must register for a spot. Don't miss our next episode when we speak more in depth with Marty and Patty about this great charity and the mission they are on. Our primary goal is to disseminate good information about RVs and RVing to the consumer. We do that in a number of ways. One method is through our weekly RVE newsletter. But when it comes to RV newsletters, you won't find one more interesting and informative than Chuck Woodbury's weekly e-newsletter at RVTravel.com. Chuck is a friend of ours who we have worked with for over a decade now. He has published the RV Travel e-newsletter for over 10 years, and I don't think I have ever seen Chuck miss a single issue. If you RV now or are thinking about an RV in your future, you owe it to yourself to subscribe to Chuck's e-newsletter. Just go to www.rvtravel.com and sign up. Next Saturday morning, you'll be enjoying a cup of coffee while you read one of the best RVE newsletters in the RV cyber world. Tune in for the next episode of Mark's RV Garage when Mark and Tyler finish the framing and start the rough-in wiring on the old Yellowstone trailer. Join Mark as he discusses the importance of using a surge protector to protect your RV electrical system and learn some techniques for backing a fifth wheel trailer and much more. Episode number five will be available for viewing on 4 April 2011. Until then, travel safe, have fun in your RV, and remember, when it comes to learning about your RV, we've got you covered. Take a minute to visit www.rvconsumer.com and I'll see you right back here on the next episode of Mark's RV Garage.